There's a phrase that I like to use whenever I'm teaching in Sunday school. I try to work it into every lesson with the kids. God designed you with every gift, talent, and ability that you need to do what He has called you to do. I've been teaching Sunday school at Northside since my family started attending here. I don't remember exactly how many years ago that was, but the students that I had in my middle school Sunday school classes, they're in their 30s now, so I guess it's been a while. After a while, my wife and I started teaching down in Critterland, which is our worship service for our four-year-olds and kindergartners. Didn't realize it had been almost 10 years until one Sunday morning when we're there and some of the student helpers are in there and they're talking about remembering when they were in class and I was teaching. Realized at that point I'd, I'd been around a while. A couple years ago, my wife and I finally promoted up to the Inside Kids Worship Service. That's the program we have for first through fourth graders. And we got to continue to build those relationships that we started with the kids back in Critterland. We have a great time, and I'll be honest, there's not a day that I walk through these halls on a Sunday morning where I don't get a high five or hugs from former students. Those relationships that we've built over the years have just been fantastic. Now, if you think, you know what, teaching isn't my thing. Look, there are plenty of other ways that you can serve. When I say teaching, I just mean spending time with those kids. You wanna tell me that you don't have the energy, you're too busy? Look, I am 58 years old, I run my own small business, I'm finishing a remodel on my house, I'm flipping another house, and I'm raising nine, 10, and 11-year-old grandkids. These kids that you're gonna be working with, they're not gonna drain your battery, they're gonna recharge your battery. They're gonna be the reason that during the middle of the week, somebody looks at you and says, why are you smiling? And you're gonna be laughing about some crazy antics that these kids pulled off while you were spending time one hour, once a month with these kids they will recharge your batteries. You're gonna have a blast. All right, now before you tune me out and say, no, 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 this isn't me, I need you to know two things, very important. First off, they're gonna provide everything that you need. You don't have to come up with a creative lesson. You don't have to come up with anything. They're gonna provide it for you. You're gonna walk in. If you can look at a sheet of paper and love on kids for an hour, you've got it. The second thing you need to know, God designed you with every gift, talent, and ability that you need to bring Him glory. You were created that way. You have everything that you need to bring God glory. It may not be the gifts, talents, and abilities that you wanted to have, but they're the ones that He gave you because He has a purpose for your life and He wants to use you. All right, still think you can't do it? Well, perfect. That means that you are in exactly the right spot. When you walk through that door, you know you can't do it, you're gonna let God do all the heavy lifting. That's awesome. I guarantee you, if you will open your eyes to see it, you will get to watch the Holy Spirit at work. You will get to see things happen in that classroom that you just never imagined could be possible. The, the feeling of knowing that the Holy Spirit worked through you to impact these kids, it's amazing. We were created to bring glory to God. So come on, Northside family. Who are you gonna impact today for the kingdom? Man, can we just thank God for what he's doing through Bruce and that ministry? And man, I'm so grateful to Bruce because, uh, well, first of all, I just know he understands what it means to be overwhelmed. He, he understands the feelings and feeling the weight of responsibility uh, through his own personal business and through work and raising grandkids. I mean, everything he's a part of, and yet consistently, week in and week out or month in, whatever his rotations have been, just he has been engaged and involved in ministry through this church, impacting people's lives because he knows that the bride of Christ matters. He knows, you know, who else is going to do this? <laughs> There's no one else in this community that's going to invest in people for the kingdom purposes, but he is. And he, he loves the church, he loves people, and he's serving. And I'm just so grateful to Bruce. In fact, his wife's even uh, cooking right now for us. Our leadership team meets once a month, and today our elders and deacons and some of our staff, and I know we'll get to be with Rob and Jody today a little bit as well. And so we're just excited about being able to be together, and Brenda will be cooking that meal for us. I mean, they just find ways to just help the church thrive. And I loved how he said that God has given each and every single one of you the gift, the talent, the ability that you need to do what God has called you to do. And I just want to encourage you because I know that right now, if you're for some reason not regularly 
engaged in ministry here at Northside. God wants to use the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given you for the bride. Like those were given to you not for yourself but for others to expand the kingdom. And if we did that, I'm telling you, the energy in this place would go from here to here. The momentum would go from here to here. We, the excitement would go from here to here. The energy picks up because when everybody's doing their part, we see the kingdom expand. And if today you're sitting here and you listen to Bruce and you're like, you know, I'm not really engaged in anything right now, I would just say like, what's holding you back? If it is fear, if it's this idea, I don't know that I'd be very good at that. Uh, great, Bruce reminded us, you know, you, you'll just lean in and let God do the heavy lifting. If for you, it's, man, I got an every other weekend work schedule, great. So do a lot of people that are serving in this church, and we find ways to make that work. Maybe for you, if it's, you know, man, I don't, I, I'm afraid I'll just get burnt out. Not how we do serving here at Northside. It doesn't work like that. And in fact, it actually, wherever your investment is, like that's where your heart is. Like you'll find that you're actually more engaged in the church. You're, you're getting off the sideline and doing something for the kingdom. You, you in this moment begin to realize you, your priorities start to align more with the heart of God when you're serving the bride, the church. And so he's going to use you to make more disciples by your contribution. And so I just want to encourage you today that if you're not yet doing that, I just want to pray that, that, that today there be something within you that the Holy Spirit would just spark that says, I want to be a part of that. I, I want to join that. I, I, I should use my gifts for the kingdom. And you're going to experience the joys that come with that as well. So today in your seat pockets in front of you are the, the connection cards in there, like we always have, but one of those on one side will say volunteer, and it's a way just to open the door for the conversation for you to say, hey, I'm, I'm interested in leveraging and, and using my gifts for the kingdom and being a part of seeing God do something good in this church. And uh, so we want to invite you to do that. Also, we're going to have some of our leaders uh, out at the tables in our lobby. They got some, most of them have some green shirts on out there for, that are uh, facilitating ministry. They would love to talk to you. So just kind of go out to the central lobby to those tables there. They've got some connect cards there as well that have the volunteer side on that. So just you can fill that out. Of course, you can always go to our website to get that as well. But we got people to talk to you. We got cards to get the conversation started. And I just want to encourage you today to realize that God wants to use you. you know, I know from our children's ministry to teens to college life ministry, just in that age group, that doesn't even count our adult ministries, they said, man, if we had 64 people, like we'd, be, we'd feel like we'd be really uh, operating in a way that we can make our biggest impact uh, in this community. Because we're serving not just those who are here, but those who are not yet here. And so you may say, man, 64 that's a lot. Well, that's not even all that's needed. So in other words, you are needed. Anytime you think, man, someone else probably has this. No, they don't. No, they don't. Uh, God wants to use you. That's why he's gifted you with that gift of grace. And so uh, I just want to invite you to be a part of this. And today's the day when you can do that. I, I want to just say a prayer over this as we pray together. And so, Lord, uh, we are so grateful that God, your Holy Spirit that dwells in us, empowers us not only to live and walk with Jesus, but empowers us with your gifts, Lord, to edify your bride, the church, the body of believers. You're using us to help be a part of expanding the kingdom and making disciple makers. And Lord, because of that, I know that you want to use each and every person. And Lord, uh, I just want to pray that our priorities would be your priorities. Our heart would be aligned with your heart. That God, we would we would find that by investing deeper here, uh, we see a greater impact there. And we just want to pray that, Lord, you would just do a good work through this. Pray that we could serve well together, knowing that um, not only is this body of believers encouraged, but we would see energy and momentum increase in significant ways. So I just pray your blessing over this. Thank you for those who are serving and giving, even now, throughout this building, throughout this morning. Thank you for every person uh, who is expressing their gifts today. And thank you for your spirit who moves us, who shakes us up, Lord, who uses us in the strength that you give. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. All God's people say, amen. You know, no one intentionally messes up their lives. The problem is they don't plan not to. Like, I don't know anybody who intentionally planned to go bankrupt. And I don't know anybody who intentionally planned to become an addict. 
I don't know anybody who intentionally became addicted to their devices or their vices, whether it was to pornography or a substance. Like they didn't intentionally plan it. No one plans to overeat or overreach or overmedicate or overspend. They don't plan to. They just don't plan not to. And last week, we began this new series. It's a short one called Pre-Decide. Corey kicked it off for us. And I want us to look at a scripture that he used to start this series. And in this series, we're just looking at what wisdom looks like when it's applied to our decisions and our choices. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 21, here's what Paul says there. He says, indeed, we are giving careful thought to do what is right, not only before the Lord, but also before people. Like we're giving careful thought to do what is right. And that Greek word for careful thought, pronoeo, give careful thought, it's, it's translated perceive forward. Perceive forward. Think ahead. Pre-decide. Think ahead about this. It also carries the idea of providing for something. So we're going to think ahead so we can provide for something. We can provide for a greater purpose. We're going to think ahead so we can provide for something so that we will do what is right. It's this forward thinking, this thinking ahead, this pre-deciding that is so important. And here's why that is so important that we think ahead on this. is because life is the sum of the decisions we make. Life is the sum of the decisions we make. Every decision matters. Every one of them. Oftentimes, we put too much weight in our thinking on the big decisions, the really big decisions that we make. We think to ourselves that, that typically the, the outcome is based, is based on those few big decisions that we make in the few big moments of our lives, when really, typically, the thousands of normal decisions that are made in those thousands of normal moments, those are the decisions that have the greatest effect on our lives. Every decision matters. This last Tuesday, it was Election Tuesday, and we had people coming from our community to our church because we're a polling location. So we saw them parking in our parking lot, coming into our building, voting because they believe and they know that every vote matters. You know, we talk about that. Every vote matters. And so get out and vote and, and do that. Every decision matters. It was James Clear who said, every decision you make is a vote. It's a vote toward who you will become. Every decision is a vote. If every vote matters, every decision matters because every decision is a vote to who you will become. Our daily decisions matter. And those good decisions are going to be compounded in a good direction. And our bad decisions are going to be compounded in a very bad direction. And so we need to remember that because if you choose to speak negatively about someone or something else and you're a little cautious at first to see if it's received well or what kind of response you get, and when you don't get a negative response and you see that it kind of painted someone in a bad light the way you intended, then you're more tempted to share it that way again. And so gossip compounds. But on the other hand, if you are guarded with your words, speak only that which builds others up so it might benefit those who listen and you watch your words, you're going to find that, that encouragement and kindness, that compounds. If you choose to make purchases without any prayerful consideration, and so suddenly you're, you're splurging, you're spending money on things, this is what you want. You haven't prayerfully considered that at all. Greed always compounds. It grows. On the other hand, if you prayerfully consider how you're spending your money and you count your blessings with a spirit of thanksgiving for what God has given, you're going to find that gratitude Gratitude compounds with good decision-making. If you choose to mull over the hurt that another person has caused you, and you mull it over and over in your mind, and every time you see something that irritates you, you add it to the number of transgressions that have been done against you. That bitter root is just going to grow from within you because bitterness and resentment, it, it compounds. We are the sum of our decisions. Those decisions matter and the problem is this, our bad decisions begin when we respond to temptation's whisper in our ear with this idea of just this once. And that's often how, at times how bad decisions get started, just this once. And so I'm just going to splurge just this once. But that turns into another splurge after splurge. I'm, I'm going to lust just this once and get it out of my system, and then it'll be, get better. But I think we all know by now, lust doesn't work that way. And so when I lust, it 
it compounds, it, it grows, it doesn't satisfy. Craig Rochelle, in his book, Think Ahead, he wrote this book, Think Ahead, which is, is the inspiration for this series, and a lot of the content I'll even share today comes from that. It was a great book where he talks about how the decisions you make today, uh, they lead to the God-honoring life that you want tomorrow. And he just shares from personal experience how he was trapped in this cycle of poor decision-making in his life, but he shares what he discovered through this, the power of pre-deciding by us perceiving forward, thinking ahead, especially what I want to talk about today as it relates to temptation when we face it in our life. That, that this is actually one of the ways that we resist it. It's one of the ways that we fight it. It's important for that. He says the devil is coming for you. His mission is to steal and to rob and to take everything that matters to the heart of God. He's coming for you. So there's some things that we need to pre-decide because we're not as strong as we think we are. We, We won't be able to resist like we think we can because every one of us is a lot like the disciples on that night before Jesus was arrested and, and then crucified the next day, when he's talking to them at their last supper, their time together, they loved him. They loved Jesus. And they would have told you then how much they would have been willing to give their life for him. Jesus told them that they would all fall away on account of him. And Peter, who loved Jesus and meant this when he said it, said, even if all fall away, Jesus, I will never fall away. I'm with you all the way. And he meant it with everything he had. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, I tell you, tonight before the rooster crows, you will deny me, that you even know me, three times. And Peter looked at Jesus and he said to them, even if I have to die with you, Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Even if they fall away, I never will. He believed it. He believed it wholeheartedly. And Matthew 26 tells us all the other disciples said the same. We often think that we have the power to resist temptation more than we actually do. And so in their moment of weakness and fear, And when they faced the risk of imprisonment and death, yeah, there was that moment when Peter pulled that sword and he was gonna take that guy's head off and must have had some bad aim and got his ear and Jesus said, we're not gonna fight that way. And when they realized this is not a fight, it's not a battle and we could be in prison and what could they do to us? In their fear, they ran away, they scattered, leaving Jesus by himself, exactly as Jesus said it would happen. In that moment, they went into hiding and Peter later, while standing around a campfire, getting as close to Jesus as he possibly could, oh, he wanted to so deeply to be there for Jesus. But when they started saying, hey, you were with him and you're that guy and the pressure was on three times, he says, I do not know him. The rooster crows. Peter immediately realizes what has happened, looks to Jesus because he's a short distance away and Jesus is looking at him eyeball to eyeball. Peter's devastated. He was not ready. It's why Jesus had told Peter and the disciples in the garden when he took them with him to pray because Jesus knows how temptation works. Jesus went into that garden of Gethsemane to watch and to pray and he told the disciples, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Your spirit is so willing, but your flesh is weak. You've got to watch and pray. The evil one is coming for you. That's the start when it comes to the battle of temptation. We, the starting point to making good decisions is to watch and to pray. And Scripture reveals how much we need this. Galatians 6.1 says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves, or you too may be tempted. Perceive forward, make future provision for this moment by watching and praying that devil's coming to kill, steal, destroy. He wants to destroy everything that matters to the heart of God, and you matter to the heart of God. And in 2 Corinthians 9, or 2, 9 through 11, Paul wrote the Corinthian church so that, he says, so that Satan will not outsmart us, and we should not be unaware of his schemes. Watch and pray. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, the text there says, so if you think you're standing firm, 
be careful that you don't fall. We, unfortunately, oftentimes, vastly overestimate our ability to resist temptation. The technical term for this is restraint bias. You think you can fight off more than you can fight off. You think you can handle more than you can handle. You can deal with more than you can deal with. And, and we see it happen all the time. And, and, you know, when you're at the office, I know here at the church, it's, it's not uncommon for us to get some good snacks here. You know, there's events here. People bring food here. gets left in the office. Let's bless the staff, right? And so they'll bless us sometimes. And it is a blessing. But sometimes it's sitting back there around the corner in our little uh, kitchen area back there in the office. And I, it, my office is the closest one to that. So I can come out of that baby and I can make a decision that says, you know what, I'm eating healthy today. I'm going to do a better job today. I'm not going to that stuff. And I can do great. First, second, third, fourth time, buy the chocolate cake with icing that's sitting there on the counter. But man, there comes that moment when you're just like, you know, a little is not going to hurt. So you get it, start breaking into that thing. Next thing you know, I'm looking, for, I'm asking someone for a napkin. I got chocolate on my hands. And I, there's, you know, it's this, this idea of, of willpower, it's, it's weak. And the reason it's weak is because it's a limited resource. Fighting temptation is fatiguing. It's tiring because that same part of our brain that we use to fight temptation is the same part of our brain that controls willpower and it has other responsibilities like coping with stress, monitoring emotions, making decisions. We get decision fatigue after we make decision after decision after decision. And after a period of time, that starts to break down. In those moments, we need to know that's when the devil attacks. In our weakness, you have to pre-decide, watch and pray so that you are ready in those moments. And Craig talks about three pre-decisions that we need to make to fight against temptation, to help fight against willpower and decision fatigue. And so Craig mentions this in his book, Think Ahead. And here's those three things right here. Move the line. We need to move the line. We need to magnify the cost. And we need to plan an escape route. We need a way out. And so we need to pre-decide, first of all, to move the line. Anytime someone draws a line and says, do not cross this line, whatever you do, you may not cross. And you're like, which line? Oh, this one here? Do not cross the line. Do not cross the line. What do every one of you want to do? Your kids are with you. Maybe you're at a wedding rehearsal. Maybe your child is the ring bearer, the flower girl, something like that, and it's, it's at like a country club, so you're out on the poolside deck, tables, chairs. There's a swimming pool, and you got your kid all kind of looking nice for the wedding rehearsal, and so you tell your child, do not get in the water. Water, deck, don't get in the water. Come with me. So we go, you go to the table. The evening goes on, 30, 45 minutes, an hour. I don't know how much time it is. Maybe it's less than that. But pretty soon you look over and crisscross applesauce on the deck over here, just sitting here. And pretty soon you peek over and the fingers are just touching the water. Not in the water, just touching the water. And then a little later, if you were to come back later, you'd find the shoes and socks are off and just kind of, you know, kicking the water, not in it, just touching it. We, we see how close to the line we can get. And we do this in life with our decisions. This is sexual integrity. This is not honoring the Lord with our bodies. Well, then how close to the line can we get? What's that look like? If we go right here and try not to fall in. If this is prayer requests, and this is gossip, then how can we share our prayer requests and our concerns without talking about someone else? It's not ours to share. And we just continually get as close to the line as we can possibly get. And when we look at the examples we see in Scripture, it's not about coming close to the line and letting temptation snag us again and again and again. Maybe for you, you find yourself when it comes to, to social media. Maybe when it comes to social media for you, you realize that, man, you, you need to move the line. I mean, we don't do this with dangerous stuff. Like carbon dioxide in your home. 
We don't say, I wonder how much carbon dioxide we can allow in our home and it not affect me, like in a really bad way. I mean, no, we don't do that. We have carbon monoxide detectors in our home, so we'll detect what's going on. It can alert us so we can get away from that. If you go on a flight across country, the pilot doesn't get on and say, hey, we're taking a few moments to to get rid of a little bit more fuel. We should have enough to get there. We're trying to get just enough to make sure that we can get there and land. No, we don't do that. We we want to make sure that we got plenty of fuel. We want to, that was what we need to do is we need to move the line. We need to quit trying to see how close to the line we can get, and we need to move the line. Why would I resist a temptation in the future if I can completely eliminate it today? Why would I resist one in the future if I could just totally eliminate the temptation right now? Why am I opening the door for Satan to have temptation after temptation coming into my life when I know over a matter of time I'm going to get decision fatigue? I'm going to get mental fatigue on this battle, temptations like that. Why would I do that? And so if you find yourself on social media, and the next thing you know, you're just watching reel after reel after reel after reel over time, so now you're wasting time, and you know you, you tend to do that. Why are we watching reels? We need to move the line, or we need to go to settings and advance time options to set a limit each day, maybe to what we're even spending on our devices. 30, 45 minutes, it stops. Maybe for you, if you find when you watch reels, you, temptation, you're just bringing the temptation onto your device because the algorithm does that. And so the temptations start coming. You're just inviting it into your life. Why do we do that? Maybe for you, if you succumb to temptation because you're spending a lot of time with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, and so in that time alone, In that place, this is where we battle temptation. Why would we not just move the line? And moving the line, you say, man, I'm I'm kind of missing out. It's so restrictive. It's so restrictive. Maybe I'm missing out on some fun or some pleasure, but here's what you're not missing out on. You're not missing a fleeting moment of pleasure for guilt and regret and missed opportunities and unproductivity and the lack of integrity and getting even just getting your life back. So we need to move the line. We become negligent. We become negligent because we don't move the line. We just continue to drift and drift closer to whatever that line is. And then in our own thinking, that line just keeps moving and we move with it. We need to move the line in a way that moves towards holiness that moves towards Jesus. We've allowed sin and other things to hinder us and negatively affect us and compound in us because we live dangerously close to the line. So we need to move the line. The second thing we need to do is magnify the cost if I cross that line. We need to magnify the cost because we tend to have this, this ability to vastly underestimate the, the consequences of our sin. The cost of our bad decisions. This is what the evil one does. He did it with Adam and Eve in the garden, with Eve when he was tempting her. And he said, you won't surely die. He was minimizing the cost of her sin. But then once we sin, he magnifies the consequences. Shame, guilt, telling you that You are ugly and you are worthless and you're of no value and you're embarrassing and you're pathetic. You're so ugly compared to others. You can't be trusted. You you can't ever amount to anything. You've already messed up. You might as well go all the way. And over and over, he magnifies the consequences and the feelings of sin, but he minimizes the costs of it whenever we're weighing it. And you need to ask yourself in moments like this, What is the worst case scenario if I do this? You need to magnify the cost in your own mind. What's the worst case scenario? What could this lead to? What could happen because of this? And you need to be reminded of that in your mind. Maybe someone could get pregnant. Maybe someone could lose reputation. Maybe someone could compromise their relationship with their kids. Maybe someone could just be drawn into greed and into debt. Maybe for somebody, they could just be turned off to the gospel because of how I treat other people. It it goes on. We need to magnify the cost instead of minimizing it. Numbers 32, 23 says, you will be sinning against the Lord and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. Five minutes of sin can just wreck our pursuit of Jesus in that moment. So we move the line. Why? Why would I 
resist a future temptation if I can eliminate it today. Now, I'm not saying, let's be clear, we're not saying that you can eliminate all temptation. Jesus was perfect and holy and lived a sinless life and was tempted in every single way just as we are because that's what Satan does, in the, especially in moments of weakness. He tempts us. Temptation's not the sin. And so I'm not saying that every temptation is going to be eliminated, but there are so many temptations that are coming in your life because you have opened the door to them and you could eliminate many temptations if you chose to move the line and to magnify the cost. And so I think it's important that we see the truth of this. James 1, 14 to 15 says, but each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desires and they're enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it's full grown, it gives birth to death. Like I, my own evil desires. And when I allow that to take root and and give it birth, and it gives birth to sin, and it leads to death. It's a a horrible tragedy in my life. So we need to move the line. Several years ago, uh, we were doing a series on temptations people face. We, every week was temptations men face, women face, singles face. We just went through the whole thing and did it. On the week I was doing women face, I'm not a woman, and so I did a uh, sent out an email that just said, what are temptations women face? And that very day, I got 20 emails back on that same day that I sent it out, 20 emails. And I actually found it surprising what was being reported, the temptations that women face. It wasn't what I thought it would be. Uh, it went a different direction than I was expecting it to go, but it was pretty consistent. So I thought I would just reveal it to you. What, from 20 women, what's the temptation that women face? And this is what it was. It was right here. (laughs) I know. I had the same reaction you did. I laughed. I totally laughed. Could not believe it. John Presco, really? This is what people said? So, yeah, that was the number one. Okay, actually, it was the number one temptation for one person of the list. Uh, Actually, 19, actually, it should not surprise you. 19 did not say this. Not 19. There was only one. And I feel like I probably need to call her out because she's continued to succumb to this over and over. And it was this woman right here. And it was, it was Brenda Presco. So Brenda <laughs> lives, like literally lives with the consequences <laughs> daily of her decision making. Every single day she lives with the consequences. So anyway, um, so for the rest of you, move the line magnify the cost, and then here's the last thing. Plan your escape. Plan your escape. Since bad decisions compound, we need to have an an escape route. I want to give a bad example. I want to give a good example. In Scripture, the very bad example is Samson. He was one chosen by God, raised up by God, set apart by God. Nazarite vow. And of that Nazarite vow, also because he was belonged to the chosen people. He was not to intermarry with people who were not sharing the same faith in his relationship with the Lord. And, uh, and then he was told to never cut his hair as part of the vow that, that his strength would be maintained as he honored God in this. But Samson, who vastly underestimated the power of of the daily decisions, just it was one after another after another. And one of those was pursuing a girl that his family told him not to, who was a Philistine, who did not honor the Lord, was not pursuing God. He pursued her. And under pressure, she was trying to find out the secret to his strength so the Philistines could overpower him. She wanted to know the secret so bad. And Samson just kept, he, he started, he went over here. And he says, well... He goes, I would totally lose my strength if you just tie me with bowstrings. Tie me with bowstrings, and I become weak as any man. Sure enough, that night while he's sleeping, they tie him up with some bowstrings, and he breaks them, no problem. She's upset about it. So he says, okay, tie me up with new ropes. That'll work. They tie him up with new ropes. It doesn't work. He breaks free. He then says to her, seven braids. If you just took... Seven braids in my hair. I mean, he just keeps moving closer to the line. You take seven braids, and with those seven braids of my hair, you braid it into a fabric on the loom, and you tighten it with the pin. 
I'll become as weak as any man. And well, he's flirting even more with the line and they do that and the Philistines come in and he overpowers them, no problem. You would think at this point he would just like be like, hey, that's not a woman that can be trusted. <laughs> but no, one day she's wailing and carrying on and on. And finally says, if you cut my hair, I'd be like any man. They do. He becomes like any man. He thinks he's gonna get up in the strength of God. The Lord left him. They gouge out his eyes, put him in prison. He's grinding mill. They're avenging for their losses. And Samson just compromised his daily decisions and he never planned his escape. And because of that, he suffered the consequences dearly. Think of the times that you've caved into temptation. It likely started with you walking too close to the line. And then when it came, you failed. Bad decisions compound, but so do good decisions. They have a compounding effect as well. And I think a better example of that is Joseph, who also was chosen by God to be there for the people of Israel when a famine was going to come into the land to lead them out. And part of God's ultimate plan and purpose had Joseph going into Egypt to make that happen. His brothers, they threw him in a cistern, tied to envy and jealousy. They sold him into slavery to slave traders who take him to Egypt. There he's working in Potiphar's household. Potiphar's his master. And Joseph is a slave. But he works in the strength that God provides and he, he honors the Lord through his work. Potiphar's household is blessed like crazy. And Genesis 39 also tells us that he was very handsome. And Potiphar's wife was drawn to Joseph, wanted Joseph, started making advances at Joseph to which he would resist. And the text tells us in this moment that the time came when she came on strongly to him and told him that she wanted to go to bed with him, bring him into her bed, and he refused. He could have justified it. He could have said, I'm in a foreign land. No one's going to know. I didn't choose this life. This was chosen for me. I didn't want this. God didn't come. God didn't do what I wanted him to do, so I'm not going to do what God wants me to do. He could have said, I, I never get any relief or pleasure or anything to benefit me, nothing to my satisfaction. He could, have, he could have gone on and on about justifying the reasons why just this once would be just fine for him, but he doesn't. Not only had he already moved the line, not only had he already magnified the cost in his mind because he immediately was like, I can never do this to the master, I can never do it to you, I can never do this to my God, I can never do this. And he had already planned his escape. He knew his way out, he knew what he was going to do in that moment. And he was planning his escape. Instead, for a lot of us, we use our disappointments to justify our disobedience. When we get disappointed with God and disappointed with life, we justify our disobedience. Well, it's because, and we tend to do that, but Joseph doesn't. He predecided he would honor the Lord, he would honor God, and day after day, even with the temptation, he wasn't going to give in. He was not so strong, he was just ready. It wasn't that he was so strong. I mean, we all have restraint bias, and we think we can handle more than we can handle. So one day when he was all alone and Potiphar's wife grabbed him in that moment to take him into bed with her, he immediately just ran out of his cloak. He just left it behind, and he was out of there, darting out of her presence. He already had planned his escape. A good name was better than having a good coat on his back. He knew if, if she grabs, I run. I'm not strong enough to resist. So I'll run from it. And our God is faithful to provide a way out. He always does. This is what the text reveals in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. God will always provide an escape route for you in the face of temptation. It is there if you would see it. It's there if you would seize it and take it. It's usually already there if you would perceive forward what it is and how to get out of it. He's provided it for you. So I'm, I'm going to do a test of that right now. Really quick, I'd like for everybody just to close your eyes. In fact, let's just, we'll black out the lights, but close, out, close your eyes right now, just real quick. Because when you came into this room, clearly lit up all around this room. If you still have your eyes closed, that'd be good. But all around this room, clearly lit up, were exit signs. How to get out of this room. Now, you don't have to say this out loud, but how many of you noticed and paid attention to that before the service started? 
In fact, I want you to guess with your eyes closed right now, if you're not counting, just guess how many exit signs are in this room? Go ahead, somebody, shout out a number. I heard four, heard eight. I heard, bada, bada, bada. I'm not sure what that was, but that was funny. Um, okay, you can open your eyes, we'll keep it dark, but, and prior from where you're sitting, you're not able to see them all, for most of you. But from where I'm standing, there's nine exit signs that I can see. And then, I guess if you count the two on the screen there on either side, I guess we're at 11. But it's not really an exit. Do not be deceived. <laughs> that will not lead you to a good place. There's nine ways out of this room. And the Scripture just makes it clear that, that God is, has provided a way out for you if you would see it. Plan your escape. There's always a way out from the temptation that you are facing. He's faithful for this. So we can turn on our lights here and I want you just to think about for a moment that there is no financial temptation, no breach of integrity, no relational loss. There's no lust where God hasn't already said there's a door. There's a door out. There's another way out. There's an exit. You can take it. Don't ignore it. Get out. And you need to pre-decide ahead of time. I'm going to move the line. I'm going to magnify the cost so I, I have an accurate perspective of what actually will happen if I engage in this sin. And then I'm going to plan my escape out. And some of you, when it comes to the temptations you're facing in life, you need, you've not really planned your escape. And you're not stepping through the door when you should. No one plans to mess up their life. They just don't plan not to. So where's the enemy attacking you? Is it to judge others, be overly critical, have unforgiveness in your heart, to gossip, have lustful temptation? Is it to allure you toward entertainment or distractions or pleasure? Why resist a temptation in the future if I can eliminate it today by moving this line, magnifying the cost, and planning my escape? Where's the enemy attacking you? Are you tired and angry? Are you negligent? apathetic? What's, what's hindering you from being faithful to the Lord in this area of your life? And today my prayer is that we would say we're going to take these steps to battle temptation. We will become more like Jesus if we do. We will experience the power of the Holy Spirit if we do. We won't grieve the Holy Spirit if we do. We won't continue to fall into defeat if we do. We'll become more healthy and whole and holy as a church if we do. This is important. This is why today well, we're going to invite you in a moment for anyone who would want to make a decision to follow Jesus and repent, repent of sin and turn to Jesus so that you'd be ready to do that today. I'm going to be stepping out to decision point in a moment. I'd love to meet and talk with you there about what that looks like to give your life to Jesus. Maybe you want to become a, a member of this church. Maybe you've got something you want to pray about. Well, our prayer team is going to be on the sides of the room today. Just like always, and they'd love to pray with you and for you. And maybe there's something that you're up against, you're battling, and man, you want someone just to pray over you right now. So you can go to them and they would love to pray with you. But I also want to use this time for you to consider some things. And so we're just, we're just going to uh, dim the lights in the room there for you. But and this is some time maybe for you just to reflect. And these will be up on the screen, but then you can just kind of close your eyes in a moment of self-reflection to say, what is the Holy Spirit prompting you to do? So how are you going to move the line? Like, where is temptation continually leading you to sin? Is there any place in your life where pride and your own willpower is keeping you from escaping temptation? How will you move the line? Let's take a few moments and let's, let's just reflect on that right now. Just close your eyes and reflect on those questions. Where is the temptation leading you? How are you going to move the line?
And the Lord, help us to move the line so we can change this algorithm of our life. And Lord, I, I pray that you help us see how we can magnify the cost. Think on this for a moment. Using your own temptation, think about or list out the worst case results that could cost you dearly if you gave in to that temptation. Think about the worst case results. Finally, plan your escape. Identify, perhaps even write down your escape route. When that personal temptation comes, what's the way out that God's already given you? But you need to run, not fight in that moment. You need to run and take the exit that he's given you. Take a moment to identify that for you. finally, Jesus, we we watch and we pray. Lord, may we not continually underestimate the power of temptation and our need for your protection and the Holy Spirit in our life. And so, Lord, I pray that we would not only watch, but Lord, we would pray. Lord, praying that we would not be led into temptation, led into evil, but instead, Lord, your power would be at work in us. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, I'd like for you to take out the communion cup that you received on your way in. If you didn't receive one of these uh, at the tables at the back of our room, we've got about three tables across the back, maybe four that have these cups on them. If you would uh, go to those tables and and at this time, uh, quickly gather one of these. We want to do this because Jesus becomes this great example for us. And... I'm reflecting on Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, where it says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that we will not grow weary and lose heart. Like, consider Jesus. Throw off the sin, the stuff that's entangling us by fixing our eyes on Jesus, considering Jesus, thinking about him and his approach to this and what he did and how he endured the cross, providing a way of salvation for us. Suffering. He watched and prayed in the garden. He carried out the Father's will. Like, let's look to Jesus because he clearly did what no one else did. Let that be an example for us to follow. May that impact us to consider how he endures so that we won't give up, so we won't lose heart. We won't throw in the towel. Like, we'll keep fighting. We'll keep running in the strength that he gives. And I think there was a, a pretty powerful example of that recently of endurance and running with everything you have. I don't know if you saw Quincy's, Quincy Hall's epic sprint to the finish in the men's 400-meter final, but this... Kansas City native who's running in the Olympics. This is a picture of him 300 yards into the race. There's about 100 more to go. He's clearly in fourth place. And not only is he clearly in fourth place there, but it looked like he was fading. His teeth, he was gritting his teeth, running with everything he had. Even the commentators said, it looks like he's falling off. That's the impression it gave in that moment. But in that moment, like there was no quit in him. And he did everything he had. And in that moment, it was like every single step that he took was this tenacious blitz that he had where he was just going to gain ground. And it was like there was one step, another step, another step. And it was like he closed the gap on runner number three. And then all of a sudden, he's starting to close the gap on number two. And all of a sudden, they're like, look, Quincy Hall. Like, look what's happening. And he just kept fighting until finally at the very end of that race, within moments, this is what it looked like. 
He's crossing the finish line. Gold medal. Like he, he endured. He, he gritted it out with everything he had, <coughs> the strength, whatever strength he had. But the writer of Hebrews tells us, Jesus endured suffering. He persevered. And we look, just like we look at Quincy and we're inspired, we look to Jesus. And we are inspired, no matter what, to keep on keeping on. We would follow the Father's will as Jesus did, all the way to the cross. Jesus did it for the future hope of heaven, the joy before him, the joy of knowing that you would spend eternity with him, the joy of knowing he was fulfilling his Father's will. And today, we want to remember that sacrifice. We remember that choice that Jesus made. So we're going to take the bread. And right now, I'd like for us to receive this bread in remembrance of the body of Jesus that was broken for us to pay the price for our sins. Let's receive it together. And then we receive this juice representing the blood of Jesus that was poured out for us. Ephesians 1, seven says, for the forgiveness of our sins, we've received the redemption that we need. Let's remember that sacrifice as we drink of this together. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of your grace. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for enduring cross. Thank you for following your Father's will. Jesus, we want to be like you. Help us to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.